Here's an example. An object is dropped from rest. After five seconds, what is its displacement? An object is dropped from rest. After five seconds, what is its displacement? Please copy this problem carefully and accurately into your notes uh, and then try to solve the problem. So now would be a good time to pause the video. Remember that you should always pause the video and try a problem on your own before you proceed uh, with the video to see how we solve it together. In our earlier series of videos on general one-dimensional motion, I introduced a systematic five-step method for doing projectile problems. Uh, so I hope that all of you have watched that series and are familiar with that method. That's the method we're going to be using on these problems. So I hope that you try to use that method on this problem. Remember that step one is to draw the object's path. So let's draw the path of this object. Uh, well, we can draw that it's starting over here and then it's moving down. So here's the object's path. Even when the path is very simple, you should still get in the habit of drawing it. And we should always indicate the initial and the final points. So here's our initial and our final points. What else can we put in here? Well, we know this final point happens after five seconds. So let's label that that final point is after five seconds. The object was dropped from rest. That tells us that at the initial point, the velocity was zero meters per second. So we can label that at the initial point, our velocity was zero meters per second. And the question is asking for the displacement. Well, we can build that into the diagram here. Remember that since we're working vertically, the symbol for displacement will be delta y. Uh, we've already seen in the previous series of videos that it's really helpful to use a question mark to indicate the question. So here's a bunch of stuff that we can build into our diagram. Something else that I want to encourage you to do every time you draw the path is, alongside it, draw the velocity and acceleration vectors. Well, this object is moving down, so its velocity is down. And we know that in free fall, your acceleration is always down, because the acceleration is coming from gravity. So here's our acceleration coming from gravity, which is down. So this is all part of our step one drawing the path, and then drawing a bunch of other things that are convenient to draw at the same time as the path. Try to get into the habit of always drawing the velocity and the acceleration vectors next to the path, and try to build as much information as you can into your path. Uh, it really helps to have a nice, clear picture. Now, our step two is to choose a positive direction, if we haven't done so already. Well, in this case, we haven't had a reason yet to choose a positive direction. Now, this object is moving down, so I think it's, it's a little bit better to choose down as our positive direction. And now we're going to be using, an, uh, now we're going to be using a y-axis. In the previous series of videos, we usually used x-axes because we usually imagined horizontal motion. But now we're definitely working with vertical motion, so it's more natural to use a y-axis for vertical motion. Now, here's something where I think some people might have different tastes. Um, so, uh, I usually recommend that people choose the direction of motion as the positive direction. I think that for a beginning student, you're less likely to make mistakes if you try to get into the habit of using the direction of motion as your positive direction. Some people try to get into the habit of just almost always choosing up as the positive direction. Some teachers in some books like to just almost always choose up as the positive direction. And then there's actually something to be said for that. There's some pros and cons on either side. Um, in these videos, I'm going to be usually choosing the direction of motion as the positive direction. I think that's maybe a little bit better for beginning students who are um, likely to make mistakes. I think you're a little less likely to make mistakes with the signs if you usually choose the direction of motion as your positive direction. Uh, there's nothing wrong about um, people who prefer to choose up as the positive direction. That has some advantages. Uh, but that's not what we're going to do in these videos. So I hope that it, um, if you're taking the time to watch these videos, I suggest that you should try to do the problems the same way that we'll be doing them here. So while you're watching these videos, I suggest that you generally choose the direction of motion as the positive direction. Uh, even though, like, like I said, um, once you get more comfortable with these problems, if you prefer to usually choose up as positive, that, that might work for you too. But we're going to choose the direction of motion as the positive direction. So that will be down here. What's really important is whatever you choose as the direction of motion, you need to write it down. 
I hope that uh, if you've already watched the previous series of videos, you're all automatically always writing down your axis and indicating the positive direction on that axis. This arrow here is pointing down. That's how we indicate that downward is the positive direction. If we were going to choose upward as the positive direction, I would have written that like this. So whatever you decide to choose as your positive direction, the really crucial thing is to write down what your positive direction is. Don't skimp on that step. Don't skimp on step two. Make sure you write down your positive direction. All right, now step three of the systematic approach is to break things into components. But we still don't really have to do that because we're only working in one dimension. That step is not going to be important until we get to two dimensions. Uh, so we don't need to worry about breaking things into components. Step three, that won't become important until we get to the two-dimensional problems, which will be in a later series of videos. The next step is very important. Step four, write down the kinematics variables. Here's our five kinematics variables. And now since we're working with a y-axis, we'll be indicating that everything's in terms of y. Delta y, the initial y, the final y, a sub y, and t. In your textbook, when they first talk about one-dimensional motion, they might not bother to always indicate that everything's a y component, since we're not really working with an x component. So in your textbook, um, you might not see the variables always indicating that they're working with the y-axis. But I think it's a good habit to already get into the habit of all, always indicating which component you're working with. Because remember, the main reason we're studying this material is to prepare us for doing two-dimensional motion. Well, in two-dimensional motion, it's always going to be crucial to indicate what your x component variables are and what your y component variables are. So I think it's a good habit to um, already start getting into the habit of indicating that we're working now with the y components. So even if your textbook um, wouldn't indicate that this is the initial y and the final y. I think it's a good habit for us to do that. All right, now we need to read carefully through the problem and put all the information um, down in the right place. Uh, now, the first thing we can do right off the bat is write our vertical acceleration. Even without reading the problem, we've already seen that this is a free fall problem. Um, we know our acceleration is going to be 9.8 meters per second squared. I'm going to write down the units for that. Um, in the uh, previous series of videos, I usually didn't write down the units when I was originally um, working with the kinematics variables, but I'm starting to feel a little bit guilty about that. Units are really very important in physics, so maybe I should have been emphasizing that even more than I have been. So I'm going to now start, start getting in the habit of writing down the units at this point as well, and I suggest you should probably do that as well. You should be writing down the units at this point as well. So this acceleration is 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, now, the thing that's very important here, though, is to show the sign. We've got to show the sign. Well, we've decided that down is our positive direction, and we're accelerating down, so our acceleration would be positive 9.8. If we had decided to choose up as the positive direction, then this acceleration would be negative. But as I said, I think that for beginning students, um, it's probably better to choose the direction of motion as your positive direction, uh, usually. Okay, so we can do this automatically now that we know that we're working with free fall. Um, by the way, notice that the problem did not specifically say to ignore air resistance. The problem did not specifically say to ignore air resistance. Um, but generally speaking, when you're doing the problems in the early chapter in your book on projectile motion, even if they don't tell you to ignore air resistance, that's what they want you to do. We can see we're supposed to ignore air resistance because otherwise we can't solve the problem. Um, there isn't enough information here to solve the problem if we have to take air resistance into account. So normally, um, you're expected to ignore air resistance unless the problem gives you a good reason to pay attention to it. You should ignore air resistance unless it's obvious from the problem that you're supposed to be paying attention to it. All right, uh, object is dropped from rest. Well, that's some important hidden information. If it's dropped from rest, that tells us the initial velocity was zero because originally it was at rest. We already noticed that, so that would be zero meters per second. Make sure that you read carefully to get all that hidden information. After five seconds, that would be the time. What is its displacement? When we see the word what, we know that's the question. I hope from the previous series of videos, you've gotten into the habit of always indicating the question with a question mark. As I've said, that's a really useful problem-solving technique. 